front because in the front you can hear everything way better. So please stand up and come to the front, please. Please. <laughs> Yeah, also because they brought some um, elements and you can't see them in the back. So if you come more to the front, they you can see them way better. So please come to the front. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, then I would like to give the word to Harold, are you going to start? Uh, Sonica is going to start. Uh, thank you all for coming. Hello. Hello. Welcome for being here at our lunch lecture. lecture. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little something about Blitta, who we are, and then uh, Harold is going to talk about uh, the uh, detailing uh, of facade. So, <laughs> who is Blitta? Uh, we are a facade specialist. Uh, we build and construct uh, special facade uh, uh, constructions uh, all over the Netherlands, uh, especially, but also some in Belgium. Um, we do uh, about uh, 20 to, to uh, 30 million uh, a year um, with 110 people. So that's quite uh, big uh, projects that we do, uh, and mainly in Holland and in uh, Belgium. Um, we specialize in project solutions, as you can see here. So we uh, build uh, uh, special facades that uh, most other constructors can build. What is our unique selling point? Um, the total solutions that we offer. So we have everything in our own um, company, uh, from product development until service and maintenance. Um, with product development, uh, we make custom-made products, uh, but we also do co-design and co-makership, so we're uh, completely responsible for the total of the facade uh, that we're going to build, uh, and we do that from the start. So from sales, uh, we make these special constructions. Uh, we are also currently active in uh, s with sustainability, mainly uh, certification, but also high demands of reuse of aluminium, because aluminium is a product that can uh, be used over and over again, and we do that in our projects as well. Uh, with regarding to BIM, uh, we use BIM engineering till the highest level. We also use it in our production for the cutting of profiles, so we go way beyond the normal contractors um, with that regard. Um, what we specialize is, is uh, prefabrication, so that means um, minimize the working conditions on site and make integrated uh, facade solutions uh, with a controlled wind and water tightness. Harold will also tell you more about that. Then two projects that we uh, made uh, prefabricated. This is uh, Maaswaard in Venlo. It's a prefabricated facade with integrated solar panels and facade cladding, and we all made that in our factory in uh, Venray. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, Lab 42, uh, University uh, of Amsterdam. Uh, this is also a unitized facade, but a very special one because the elements are very, very big. So there are seven meters uh, by three meters high. And uh, this one is mounted from top down. And that's for uh, yeah, and a circular facade as well. Okay, and now I would like to give the word to Harold. Hi, everyone. Um, I welcome you to this little guide for architectural uh, detailing. 
um, I try to squeeze as much in uh, this few minutes that we have. So if I'm going too fast, put up your hand and I will slow down a little bit. Um, you will see uh, that uh, we have a few points uh, that we are going to, uh, um, to address the, this evening. Oh, this afternoon, sorry, it's not evening yet. Uh, the architectural membrane, the functionality, is just a quick wrap up so we have a, a base level of understanding. Uh, the basic of the facade systems is also a little bit for uh, having a level of, of knowledge. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, the free barrier defense. Uh, I was taught that that's the way that's taught to you to make a good barrier for water tightness, air permeability, and uh, damp. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of talk about thermal transmittance, uh, the fire barrier, and the sound transmittance, because the above aspects are all affecting uh, how you could approach the detailing for your architectural construction. So it's quite a lot. I'm not going to teach you how to draw, because I think that you are wise and clever enough to learn that yourself in uh, the programs that you have available uh, these days. So I just wanted to talk about uh, what are the checkpoints that you have to meet and know which things are of influence and uh, roughly how they work. Um, okay. We have the architectural membrane and I always like to compare it with the human skin. There is some stuff that you want to get in and there's some stuff that you want to keep out of your system. Um, what you like to get in is the sunlight and have a nice uh, taint. And, um, you want to keep the, the germs and all the viruses out as, as possible, and you want to keep the moist in. Uh, you don't want to lose your uh, moist uh, just like that. Um, for a building, is almost the same. What do you want to keep out? You want to keep water out. You want to keep the wind out. I called it is uh, also, between the brackets, air, because uh, in the next you will see, we want to keep sound out. We want to keep fire out, of course. Uh, to for safety regulations. But you will see what we want to keep in is the light, of course, and the daylight that we need and that we have to calculate before we're making our uh, architectural uh, design 100%. But we also want to get in air. So it's a little bit of contradiction because we want to keep it out, but in some times we want to get it in. There are a lot of ways to do it. You can do mechanical ventilation or you could uh, put ventilation grids into your facade. We want to keep the heat in, but sometimes we also want to keep the fire in due to safety regulations. We will discuss that later on. Now I want to start with the basic of facades, and uh, uh, probably a lot of you know the type of facades that I'm going to uh, discuss, but I will tell you what the specifics are and the differences are, because there are some characteristics that are different. This is uh, uh, the doors and window system. Um, you only see a window here and you see a, a door-ish function up there. Um, but why do I call them in the same? Because the most systems, um, they combine the window fans and the door fans into one basic system that has a certain depth uh, for um, your architectural connection. And, and what you can see, um, it's a void filling element. I guess the most of you had a little bit of Revit. Uh, you have to have a void to put a window in. It's a wall-based thing. In reality, it's also a wall-based thing. And I will show you why. If we look at the structure of the system, we roughly have the rebate, and the rebate is the part that we call that clamps the glass or holds the vent. And that's a, a system specific uh, uh, part, and uh, uh, you can see uh, I, I gives it some nice cool colors because um, I want to teach you uh, something about the barriers. This one is what we call uh, uh, the barrier that keeps as much water out of the system as possible, but it's not the water barrier. At the inner side we have the air barrier and it's also a water barrier. You can see in the details that here on the outside I have two. When you use a vent, this in, in this uh, case it's a door, you will see 
that the amount of, of stress points that you introduce into your facade doubles very rapidly. So if you have a high-risk building, that's something that you can take in account and say, okay, we have to keep it simple or we have to uh, try to avoid water penetration in another way. These arrows that are put there is, is a schematic of the wind load. A room of a, a window and a door system can only uh, 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 obtain is, is its counter forces from the architectural construction that's surrounding it, the timber frame that it's made in. And that's a little bit different than when you're looking to facades and uh, curtain walls and unitized curtain walls. Because you have to have some structure where you put the void and you have to take in account that it will have to bear all the loads, the wind loads, but also the glass weight. And uh, that's very important to know. That's what the, uh, the window stru uh, structure. Now we go to our next one. The next contestant is the curtain wall. Uh, what is the difference between a curtain wall and a normal uh, window? Uh, it's also a void filling element, or can be used as a void filling element, but it's not restricted to one uh, uh, floor elevation. Even it's specialized to cross more floor elevations. What is uh, 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 the common use that we use them? That's a total of a building skin, a void that we have spanning more than one elevation height. You can see uh, an example right here. And um, what we often see in the building site is that the, the plinth, the, the first floor, often is made in a sticks system. And why is that? Because you have to have transport for a lot of material due to your building process not only on the outside of your building, but also inside your building. Uh, you, you need everything, like uh, the, the rails for, uh, the, uh, for the stairs, uh, uh, toilet seats, uh, whatever. Uh, and also bigger things sometimes, the inside glazing that you, we have here, uh, which is not exterior glazing. So it's uh, convenient because the sticks uh, system, uh, you can build it up on site. So that means that with a bunch of profiles, you go to the side, you uh, adjust them, and you fix them on your onto your structure. You can easily move it afterwards, and it's glazed from the outside. So it's an exterior glazed system. That means that it's when it's on ground level, it's always accessible, and you can step it in as last part. And the other one is a big advantage. When you put it in as last part, it won't be damaged by the building uh, uh, traffic that's all around, people walking in, walking out, or and the first scratch is made. That's often a problem when we have a big project, is that we always have damage afterwards and we have to repair the damage. It can be done, but it's most of the times not easy and it costs a lot of time and money. When we look at the rebate system of the curtain wall, you can see here I have uh, made a little section. Uh, it's just a typical section. You can see uh, the rebate and uh, fixation is, is mainly panels and, and, and glazing. If you want to put in a vent, it can. But it's just, uh, 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 in reality, uh, 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 a door or window system that you put as a, as a curtain wall panel in, fill in the curtain wall. It's not part of the curtain wall. And that sometimes gives obstructions due to uh, the thermal layer because the thermal layer is about here and uh, when you have something that sticks uh, uh, behind the rebate then you could have a, a thermal problem uh, by a, a shortcut. Another difference is um, the curtain wall is, is a self-supporting system for its own weight and it will only uh, need a, a to pull off the wind loads that's on the facade and the surface by, uh, by brackets. So it's not a continuous uh, uh, architectural structure that I need for its weight and, and, and the forces. It's more, um, more locally. That also means that you have to have structure locally to fasten it. If you look here at, uh, at uh, the curtain walling here, you can see the span is too big for the system, so you have steel support, for example. But you also have to have the architectural connection that you can uh, 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 put through the brackets your gla glass load and your wind load. 
Then I'm going to the third uh, system. And uh, this is a system that we specialize very highly in. We use it in most of our bigger projects. And why do we do that? This is called a, a unitized curtain wall. And a unitized curtain wall is, is, is a modular thing. It's just like uh, playing with Lego bricks. You start on the first floor because the first of the on the second floor because the first floor will be the curtain walls and then you build up till you're at the top of your building and it's all prefabricated like Sonic already said and here you can see before uh, the project the valley in Amsterdam everybody knows the valley uh, this is where we uh, put the corner elements of the valley as an element system here you can see we already done some work here is the, the space for the plinth and you can see if we have the concrete structure and we have our anchoring all right, it's just stacking. And um, um, yeah, okay. Um, we use it mostly because uh, here in Holland, and you go to uh, uh, the western of the country, but also here, we call it building on a stamp, on a post stamp. It's just like building on a floor tile, and floor tile is all you have, but your footprint of your building is almost a floor tile. So you have no room for transport, uh, you have no room for storage, you have no room to put your vertical uh, uh, um, uh, help constructions like uh, uh, scaffolding or uh, uh, lifting scaffolding or lifts. Now you only need a crane to hoist the element from the truck onto the right spot of the building and then it's fixed. It goes very quickly and we do not need a lot of room. Uh, we'll to the next slide. Here I got some uh, details of uh, the um, unitized curtain wall. Uh, the rebate is multifunctional. Um, you see here a rebate that looks like a window system, but there are also rebates that are looking more like a curtain wall. You're very free in form to do it. Yeah, yeah, pass it around. <coughs> that's, uh, that's a little fragment of uh, the, a curtain wall system. A uh, unitized curtain wall system, and um, I will show you also with, uh, with my assistant Dimitri. Jos, could you help me, please? <laughs> you can see that, uh, just like a curtain wall, we have some anchoring where we put our uh, elements on, and this element uh, uh, anchor has to be uh, able to be justifiable in three dimensions. Um, what we have is uh, an anchor rail in the construction poured in prefab in the concrete that's almost uh, a demand that we make as a fabricator but also the contractor likes it because uh, there's a lot of other stuff that he has to uh, fasten uh, to the the floor uh, at that point so we have uh, the, the anchors uh, that's the anchor that uh, Demetrios is holding and you can see that in in in, in this space we can adjust it with the slots that are in the anchor that are uh, these vertical slots if you look you can see if I stick a bolt through it you can shove it and in the anchor rail it goes sideways and this little thing that we see here is what carries the element of the unitized curtain wall and by using screws it's so height adjustable and you can see when we have the yeah. No, it goes the other way around. Oh. But you're all welcome to try it yourself and to see how Lego works. Uh, now you see the anchor is fastened and it carries the element. But uh, I will keep uh, my presentation short so you all can have a close look and uh, stack some Lego yourself to see how it functions. Oops. That's why we need safety shoes sometimes. <laughs> okay, um, what I uh, call it here is also the same color code as we had. Here is the, the water penetration barrier of the system. And what I have given in red is water block, the water barrier, the actual water barrier and air barrier. When you see a curtain, uh, unitized curtain wall system and you have the little specimen that's going around, you will see we have three gaskets, one in the front one in the middle and one in the back. The one in the back is something that people make a lot of fuss about, but it's just for show that you don't see aluminum, but you see an eyes, vertical and horizontal black stripe. The functionality is pure visual. 
if water gets to that gasket, we have a very big problem. <laughs> but in practice, it almost never does. Okay. You all have uh, been uh, taught a little bit about the free barrier uh, defense. And uh, that means that you have to try to keep water away. You have to barrier the water that it cannot penetrate. And you have to make it airtight. What you just saw with the, uh, the, the, the facade systems is that the last two barriers, that's the water barrier and the air barrier, are almost the same in the system. But watch out, when we go back to the architectural connection, you will see it works sometimes a little bit differently. Um, what are the most important things? Uh, you want to reduce uh, the water penetration. This, uh, if you have materials that you need to stack, just think about a shingle roof. You have to make an overlap and make the overlap sufficient and stack from the bottom to the top. So when the water comes down, when the water comes trickling down, it will trickle down, trickle down, and if you stack it the other round, uh, the other way, so uh, for example, if you put this roof tile on top of that one and the water comes, then you have water penetration. Take that picture, mantle, when you have to detail, everything, cladding, foils, whatever, always make sure that it makes a roughly the shape, the principle of a roof tile. That's very important. You can see, um, what we uh, uh, have to do to make a good water barrier, and that's trying to keep a seal in one line of service to avoid joints. I have here some uh, EPDM foil, and I will let it go around. Let's try to fold it five times. And you will see that will uh, start to get a real thick package, and if you think that you have to uh, make that waterproof and airproof just by adhesive, then you understand you have a problem. It doesn't work like that. And the, the, the difficulty danger is that in the drafting, we only take one little dotted line and say that's all the foil. You can see here an example. If you have to go around corners and you are not in the same service, it's just like I'm packing my Christmas uh, gifts for my kids. <laughs> They're happy, but it doesn't look very nice. Um, what's the problem? What happens then if you have water uh, penetration in this point? Uh, you ex probably could end with problems like this, and that's something we don't want. Um, one thing that we also have to understand, that's why the water barrier and the air barrier in the facade systems are in the same plane. If you, if you go back a few, you can see I can almost write a vertical line with almost no jumps for the air and the water barrier. And they're uh, having the same uh, uh, functionality because uh, if you uh, uh, imagine yourself a dandelion when it's uh, uh, bloomed and it starts to pop seed, it becomes this nice white ball and then <laughs> and you see all the seeds going into the air and being transported by the air that you breathe. If there's sufficient air loss in whatever architectural connection situation you have, if you have sufficient air movement, it will transport water. It's just like the carburetor of a, of a motor engine. The same venturi principles work there. So if you want to build watertight, build airtight. Even if there comes water, if there's no air transport, there's no water transport. OK. Um, I've made a little, uh, very simple example of uh, uh, a window system. And you can see the, the, the orange line. That's the water penetration line. This so you want to keep as much water out as possible. But water will penetrate. You never can make it 100%. The green line is a very important line because that's the line. That's the air barrier and also uh, the water barrier. So where are the difficulties in this section? This has to connect very good. And you can see the foil is going that way. And you can see it's coming on the underside. And it's coming from the top. And it yeah, you can see the shingle. We don't put it behind the flange of the window system. We put it on top of the flange of the water system. If a little water dropper comes here, it will be nicely pushed outside, and it will be outside my water penetration line. Not a problem. 
uh, for the curtain walls, I made the same example, and uh, this one makes uh, a, a better story. Um, you can see here my curtain system starts, and this is my exterior. This is my water penetration line, and you can see the foils that we apply here, but you can see they are clamped behind the flange of the profile because it's a water barrier. Water is allowed till the green line. So that means uh, you can let me paste this foil on the building side. I will make it look nice, but I'm not a very good gluer, so it probably will leak. If you let me do this one, you can see here a foil too. That's my air and also my water barrier. If you let me do that, uh, you got a problem. <laughs> um, that's horizontally. Uh, this is an exceptional uh, uh, detail. This is not what you will see a lot in buildings. It will be a little bit simpler, but I just choose the details from the same project. This is also the valley. Um, here you can see the start of the uh, curtain wall. Here we have our concrete fundaments and we have an anchor, and we have a, 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 a mullion that goes up, and we have a transom, and you can see here my water penetration line, you can see my water tight line, hey, it goes about that. You can see here that sometimes in the system, this is the water line continuous, but sometimes you need the airtight and the water balance to your architectural connection, and we are lucky. <laughs> This is what happens. So if you want to take a look, I will show you where the foil goes and, and how it functions. And you will see uh, which things you have to take in account because you're taking uh, uh, the water tightness of the system to your architectural construction. And that's where most of the things go or can go wrong. If there's leakage, it's 99 of the 100 times the connection, not the, the system or the architectural uh, construction of itself. Here we have a, 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 a certain detail uh, of uh, an uh, element system, a curtain wall, unitized curtain wall, and you can also see, uh, this is my water penetration line, we have here a uh, water leakage. Uh, what you see is that here is a water barrier, and this is not a 100% air barrier because here we have uh, the, the mineral walls. So we need to apply an extra air barrier, and you can even see that we tape off the anchors that are in the exterior environment, and the air and the water leakage uh, barrier is, is, is this line that you can see here, the foil that I made lightly green. When you have a floor detail, here you have the concrete floor, here we have an anchor rail, we have an, a little bit different anchor than the one that I showed you, uh, here we have the anchor that I showed you. Here is where my uh, um, unitized curtain wall uh, um, goes from a curtain wall into a unitized curtain wall. Normally people will say that's not possible. We do it. <laughs> um, you see here uh, that I have drawn this uh, uh, water barrier line that you can see. The water penetration barrier line is a very obvious one. I think that every one of you would have said, yeah, yeah, okay. But there's a second one, because we have uh, the, uh, the, the transit from one system into another system, we have to make a second penetration line. You can see it by the foil that we apply here. And that means that if my first barrier fails, or there's a little bit too much wind, or there's too much air, then I have a second barrier of defense. And you can see that behind it is my uh, water barrier and the air barrier. Just to make sure that even though we make a transit which shouldn't be possible, we made it possible. But it's very uh, precarious to make. Yeah. Um, now we go into the uh, architectural uh, guide uh, to the to the heat transport. I just wanted to show you some pictures of. Uh, uh how the heat flow goes, and you see uh, the purple color is cold, this is the exterior, and the heat is the inside. And um, you all have learned probably that if you have a dampness uh, in, in, in uh, the interior uh, environment, um, there will be a dew point at a certain temperature. 
The dew point is at the green line. This is where the trouble starts. And you can see by the glass, you can also see what the influence of your, uh, um, your uh, distance, uh, sp sp the spacer is in your glass. I think this is one is aluminum. If you make it in another material, uh, it will have less effect. I guess this one uh, is a, a high uh, rendement. Um, a, a short uh, uh, example of how a floor meeting will. Uh, this is your floor slab internal. Uh, you can put there an insulator thermal break between it, uh, and then you can put on a prefab a balcony if you want. And what's the danger? The danger is condensation because we just discussed this is the danger zone, and you will see that it continues to my architectural connection. That's why we put this foil way back there because when we protect the wood by foil, it may become wet on the underside of the element. We make two little slots in the gasket and the water can escape and evaporate. Then we have uh, fire. There are a few basic situations and all kind of legislations. I will not call the legislations because only that takes a lecture of two hours and you only have talked about 20 or 20 percent. So I just will make it really uh, easy. Um, you can see here the fire and this is what happens in, in reality. Uh, you can see here how it's calculated in, in, in computer software to, to uh, make uh, uh, certain values and, and to say if we have to take precautions or not. And if we have to take precautions, uh, there are two things that are in Dutch building legislation are important. That's the, the, the fire breakthrough. That means that when here is a fire and we have a floor connection, the floor between the floor should be 60 minutes, but also the connection needs to be 60 minutes. That's horizontally also the problem. Um, but as you can see here, the flames go up and not to the sidewards. So sidewards is not as heavy as vertical. This floor detail, what we have here, is common practice in almost every project that we have. I will uh, show you uh, a few. This one is with a curtain wall. What we do is we put in a fire resistant material by a steel L profile and we fill the, the space between the facade and the concrete with a rock wall, uh, not a glass wall because that will melt, but a rock wall, it will not melt, uh, and compress it a little bit to make sure there are no air holes and air gaps. And also the anchoring is in this zone, so the anchoring is also shielded from the fire. When we go to our unitized curtain walls, you can see it uh, represented here. It's a little bit clearer, I guess. We put uh, through steel L profiles that we connect to the architectural, uh, to, the the, to the floor slab, um, but we only uh, uh, paste it to the facade because by heat you get expansion and then it's able to expand without uh, 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 the risk of getting torn down. Um, What's important, uh, the floor thickness is very important. The calculation that I showed previous, the picture, determines how high the flame will be when fire goes from one to another story. So how thicker your floors is or your floor connection is, the less precautions you have to make in your connections or in the facade systems that you have to make. Um, because uh, a curtain wall system uh, at itself is not uh, uh, fire resistant, it's very hard to get fire resistant. Yeah, unitized curtain wall. Uh, um, there's another thing that you have to take into account. When you have an inside corner in a building, so you have an L-shaped building, the inside corner, there always will be fire precautions, always, because you have different compartments and uh, you have to make sure that the fire will not leap or break through a certain amount of time calculated by a uh, building physics bureau and uh, that's something that's uh, in, in, in when you're making those nice maquettes. You can uh, see, for example, uh, that one here. See if I can find another one over there. Um, no, fortunately not. But uh, here you have a, a little inside corner. You can look later on. That's where you will have the problems. Then we go to Sound insulation, that's also a big problem you today. We have two types, there's the exterior uh, sound insulation and we have uh, a, a, a sound transmission interior. Exterior, I'm 
Just showing you this picture, and that's all because you can buy glass that's sound insulating. You can buy profiles that are sound insulating. Not interesting. What is interesting, when you're making a big office building and someone is having a meeting on the fourth floor and the one on the fifth floor can hear everything they say, that's really annoying, especially when we're having uh, a, a trade secrets or uh, someone's getting fired or hired or whatever. So uh, that's a thing that we're trying to insulate and we call it flanking uh, sound insulation and uh, the, the direct the sound uh, uh, insulation is your concrete floor slab that's heavy enough, there will nothing happen. The difficulty lays in the connection to the facade and your floor slab, the filling between the floor slab and through the system itself. And uh, here is it when you have a, a wall separation from apartment A or apartment B, if you're making a nice building block, uh, work, uh, uh, live, and, and sport. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, here at the top, this is the test where uh, the way that they test uh, uh, such uh, uh, constructions. That's uh, what I nicked uh, from someone. What can we do? It's very easy. Um, sound reduction, reduction is one word, mass. How much more mass? Because if I yell at the concrete pole, nothing happens, and if I take a thin leaf of A4 paper, it will woo -woo -woo -woo. Easy as that. So if we have a problem with sound, we can do uh, uh, adding mass. That's what you see here. This is the standard situation that they tested. This is where they put in all plasterboard inside, and it gives so much mass that if you look at the results, this one does 40 de decibels, so that means that uh, if I have 60 here, I keep 20 there. This one, does 65, so if I have 60 here, I only keep four there. The noise that you now hear is about 12 decibels, just the silence. So uh, that's the way that you can do it. There's another way that you can do it, and that's to suspend the system. Here I have the noise, uh, 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 the, the where the noise is coming from. Um, if I shield it off with mass and with something that's a little bit flexible, just like uh, a rubber or neoprene or uh, a big clap of insulation. It also will work. Uh, this one is uh, 44, and that one is 50, and if you do it on two sides, it's 52. You can see there is a limit with shielding. Uh, at the moment, it just doesn't work anymore. How does it go in practice? Here I have a connection of one unitized curtain wall and the other unitized curtain wall. And we have to make sure that we don't have too much noise from the one side to the other. What we did is we add mass and this side uh, in, in conjunction with uh, the system supplier who did a lot of testing on the sound insulation for flanking noise. Uh, so they could uh, tell that it was sufficient enough to get a certain degree of insulation. Vertically, we also do that. You can see here we have the plasterboard or whatever they, they put in. It could be another uh, material. Um, but what you also see is that the fire barrier has a double role in this part. We use uh, steel L profiles because they're fireproof. We put in compressed mineral wool. has mass, but it's also a little bit uh, suspending. So the fire barrier is also working as the sound barrier in this story. So, um, what have we learned? And now I'm going to uh, be quick. Um, I want you to remember some things uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, at heart. It's not always possible to do it, I warn you, but it's the, the principle that you have to start when you're making a detail. One, keep all the barriers in one line, and that means don't make too much jumps. Doesn't matter if it's water, if it's air, if it's fire, if it's thermal. Just try to keep an even line and you will have no problems. Everywhere, everything goes uh, another uh, direction. You always will be faced with problems. Um, when you have a connection, try to make it overlapping. Think of the shingle roof. If you do that, there's a lot of problems uh, uh, that you uh, will not have on, the on your building site and it's most of the times the most easy way to solve. Um, Another point is, 
and that's what I showed you with the window system, try to minimize the amount of joints that you have with different materials. Uh, uh, when you apply a material, is it something that's only on pieces of one meter or can you buy rolls of 100 meter? That makes a difference. Every joint is a risk that is going wrong, especially when I make them. Um, you have to pay attention to the connection of the facade system with the architectural structure because, like I already told, that's where the problems are, if there are problems. And the last one that I uh, want you to remember is try to keep things simple. You can make a lot of uh, solutions, uh, but how more complicated the solution is, how more risk you have, things go wrong. And now I hand uh, the mic to uh, Sonic again. Yeah, thank you, Harold, for, uh, for that uh, good story. Um, we have uh, a few more things planned with uh, Geops. Uh, next up is a factory visit on March the, uh, the 23rd um, next year. Uh, so if you're interested, please uh, join us. And um, uh, what will be mostly interesting is also a project visit. This is Oka House. We're currently making it in our factory, so we will probably see it if you join us at the factory visit. Uh, but we're going to a site uh, visit a after, um, yeah, at May. Um, thank you for your attention and for being here today. If you're interested in working at Blitta, uh, please let us know, uh, because we're always looking for uh, smart students. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Harold and Sonica. Uh, guys, if you need to make future points, you can get them at the back. The scanners are there. Uh, if you have any questions left, just come to the front and ask them because they were happy to help you with all your questions. Uh, thank you all for coming.